Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to San Jose Bible Baptist Church. If you'll please take out your red hymnals, please take out your red hymnals. Uh, 255, please. 255. 255. What an assurance we have that we're saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What an assurance we have that we cannot lose our salvation. One assurance we have that the Holy Spirit cannot leave us. And what, and what an assurance we have that we're going to, we have a mansion up in heaven for us, prepared by the Father. All right, 255. Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine! Heir of salvation, purchase of God, Lord of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Amen. And uh, I want to give God the glory today. Amen. So, all right, so let's sing to God be the glory, shall we? 449, 449. You know, it's very strange that people from all other parts around the world and different nationalities would come in a liberal area like this to give one person the glory. Amen. On a Sunday when everyone's tired and they want to take a day off and relax and sleep on a Sunday because of work Monday. So odd. Who would come at such a day unless we love the person and he deserves the glory? Amen. Amen. To God be the glory, great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus, the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus. 
Jesus, the pardoner is he's. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he had done, great things he had taught us, great things he had done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he had done. Yeah. Amen. All right. Well, you sound saved. You sound saved. <laughs> Please stand. Please stand. Old classic. It is well with my soul, 256. 256, old classic, 256. If you sounded like a bunch of lost people, then you would be shouting at a football stadium. <laughs> Amen, all is well with our soul. When peace like a river and of my way when sorrows like sea pillows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul it is well Satan should buffet, though trial should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my face shall be sighed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well.
dwell with my soul. Well, amen. amen. All right, amen. All right, you sound louder than a football stadium. <laughs> All right, let's start off with the word of prayer. Brother Jack, will you open up the service with the word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the gathering, uh, Lord, this gathering of uh, the saints for fellowship Amen. Uh, today on this Sabbath day. But we know, Lord, that you are a Sabbath. Lord. Yeah, that's good. We, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity uh, to, to co commune with you, Lord. And I ask, Lord, that you please forgive me for anything that I have done uh, that, that's wrong in your sight, Lord, and take away any iniquity in me, Lord, that's yes, holding me back from any fellowship, Lord, with you, Lord, and I ask, Father, that you bless the message that we hear today, Lord, and that message may be that message we need to hear this hour, Lord, yes, and God. thank you, Father, Amen. for uh, uh, the saints, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the message, we thank you for this King James Bible, we Amen. Have in the and I ask, Father, that you continue to to give us the discernment through your Holy Spirit and all the things we do, and we ask these things in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. You may be seated. All right, your white hymnal, please. Your white hymnal. Shall we try 75 one more time? 90 and 9. 75. So I cannot uh, give Brother Tom his request, but I'll, grant, I'll compromise with him and give him his second favorite. All right, 75. 90 and 9. 75 in your white hymnal, please. 75 in your white hymnal. <laughs> We go. There were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold, but one was out on the hills away, far off from the gates of gold, away on the mountains wild. Away from the tender shepherd's care. Away from the tender shepherd's care. Lord, thou hast here thy ninety and nine. Are they not enough for thee? But the shepherd made answer this of mine has wandered away from me. And although the road be rough and steep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. I go to the desert to find my sheep. But none of the ransom ever knew how deep were the waters crossed? Nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through Ere he found his sheep that was lost. Out in the desert he heard its cry, Sick and helpless and ready to die. Sick and helpless and ready to die. Lord, whence are those blood drops on the way that mark out the mountain's track? Yeah. They were shed for one who had gone astray ere the shepherd could bring him back. Lord, whence? So rent and torn, there appears to not hide by many a thorn. There appears to not hide by many a thorn. But all through the mountains thundering, and up from the rocky steep, there arose a glad cry to the gate. Of him rejoice, I have found my sheep. And the angels echoed around 
the throne. Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Amen. Amen. Man, aren't you glad that you weren't the 99? You were the 100th one. You're that one missing person, that one missing soul that Jesus Christ would leave his fold, leave his glory, just to find a wandering sheep like you when you and I didn't deserve it. And praise the Lord Jesus Christ. If our announcer would come forward and give the good news to us. Amen. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, sir. Amen. All right, so uh, the schedule seems to be as normal as usual, and he'll also read a couple missionary letters. Yes, sir. I'm glad to have everybody here. Oh, man. Praise the Lord, everybody gathered here today. Thank you all for gathering. I know the Lord appreciates it. I'm sure there's great rejoicing in heaven right now. Oh, they showed up today. <laughs> I know he's probably thinking that about me. Oh, he showed up. <laughs> Jokes aside, next week, visitation is going to be at 10 a.m. I have the address, and it's 2952 El Sobrante Street in Santa Clara. And if you're interested in attending, I will give us, give us all a reminder. If you need the address, please let me know. Call me, text me, whatever. If you don't have my contact information, come find me. I will tell you. Um, Thursday night, discipleship and Bible study is going to come um, be done on time as usual from 7 to 9 p.m. And... We have our memory verses. We're reviewing the chapter about in Isaiah about our Lord Jesus Christ, Isaiah chapter 53, and I'll read that today, Isaiah 53, and this was actually in the past month, however, we're just reviewing it, so we're doing four verses at a time. It seems like it's a lot, but it's just review, so hopefully it won't be as difficult this time around. Isaiah chapter 53, when we're going to review verses 5 through 8 this time. We did 1 through 4 last week, so we'll do 5 through 8 this time. Isaiah 53, verses 5 through 8. The Bible says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. So, lots of things about the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't complain a single time when they nailed his hands, when they nailed his feet, when they whipped him and put a crown of thorns on him. I mean, thank you, thank you, Lord, for that. So, there's... There is our memory verses. It's a review of the ones we did previously. All right, we're going to take up the Lord's offering. So if uh, Brother Sean can come forward, as well as Brother Eric, if you would come forward as well. Brother Eric and Brother Sean. <coughs> the offering plates are over there. And then, because this is Brother Eric's last day with us, I would like to ask Brother Eric to do the prayer for us in the offering as well. Well, us having a church that we can come to um, that's so much on fire and being able to do so much work for you, Lord. Amen. Um, we thank the Holy Spirit for all that. Um, we pray that uh, you forgive us for all, uh, any sins that we have. Amen. All right, now we plead the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Anything that's you know hidden will be eventually found out anyway, so we put it under the blood. That's and good. Yeah, that's, that's good. good uh, Lord, please give us the conviction for uh, souls as well. That um, you know whatever we do in the church, we do it for you, Lord, for the glory of your name, and that we can do um, as much as you know our bodies will allow us to do. Um, and I pray that uh, what we get here, as far as the uh, um, offering and the uh, tithe goes that it can be used for your glory and it's not for us lord it's that's for good you, for your name um we pray that we can you know stay on this uh fire with the holy spirit that we have in all of us uh, that we can do even more works for you in the coming future um and the next time i come back maybe we'll have even more members <laughs> yeah, that's good. Good. Amen. And, um, i'm always so thankful to have a, a home church that i can depend on um, no matter where I go. Um, Lord, uh, please give us all the wisdom to do um, what you want us to do, and uh, please bless the service that's about to happen. 
Um, we pray that whatever um, we hear in the in the service, we can take take away a lot of wisdom and um, use it in our everyday lives. Yes, God. For all these things, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Matthew, chapter 26, please. <clears throat> Matthew, chapter 26. We're going to open up our Bibles to Matthew, chapter 26, and then we'll read verse 31. Matthew, chapter 26, and we will read verse 31. I want to tell this church that uh, your pastor is very happy with your spirit and your zeal for the Lord and your faithfulness. We've been through a lot together, especially the past year, and we're beginning a new year for the Lord. Now, I've been in the ministry for almost 10 years, and I've been through Bible-believing churches nearly all my life. Uh, God blessed me to be raised in a King James-only Bible-believing environment the majority of my life. Now this is one thing that I learned about people once they have a zeal and a fire for the Lord. So I hope that this sermon will be a great help to you. So even if you think that you're very spiritual and the sermon may not apply to you, this actually applies to even the most faithful and the most zealous kind of Christian. Because there's the thing where we can lose the fire. We can lose the zeal. And unfortunately, we've seen pastors around the world becoming like that. Not just Bible-believing Christians, but even pastors as well. And the reason why is because it could be a busyness situation. It could be a temptation that you're struggling with. It could be a heavy trial that you're putting up with. It could be people around you that you hang around with that can influence you unconsciously. It could be your own household. But whatever it is, I hope that this sermon will be a great help to you. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, <clears throat> yet I will not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Now Peter, you must understand, he was the chief leader of early Christianity. He was the chief leader of early Christianity. But even a great man like Peter, he also had problems himself. You'll notice that throughout the four Gospels, there's a disciple that Jesus got on the most, and that was Peter, surprisingly. Now, why is it not the other disciples? Why is it Peter? So, listen to me now, because this kind of might sound like a little bit of deja vu for you. It might perfectly apply to you. If you ever had the most uh, rebukes in your life by men in the church who tried to guide you, or by your p parents who raised you in a good Christian environment. If you had a lot of discipline and chastisement from the Lord. And when you had a heart, you ever had a heart and a sincere desire to serve God, but you always made mistakes. Yeah, and even mistakes that not only hurt yourself, but other people around you. But you have a heart that's sincere and want to love God. That was Peter. See, that's why his mistakes are more mentioned than any other person. I mean, not Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot, what we know is that he betrayed Jesus Christ. But Peter, we see mistake after mistake, error after error. If there's a disciple that Jesus picked on, that was Peter. Why is that? Because Peter was the one who was closest to Jesus. Peter was the one striving for perfection. And when you strive closer to perfections, you you're the one who clean off the most mistakes the most errors out of all the other disciples. 
So I want you to be encouraged through this sermon, but also take this sermon as a great rebuke and conviction. Because it doesn't matter how zealous you are, in the end, if you are not watchful and you are not in prayer, then like Simon Peter, you're going to say, I'm going to go to church today. Let's go out street preaching. Hey, let's have a prayer meeting. I want to tell somebody how to get saved. I have a great desire. I want to preach on the streets. I want to help you out, pastor. Will you train me how to teach and how to preach? Listen to me now. You will be the person who will deny Jesus Christ. You might say, why is that? Because Satan keeps his eye out on those who go closer to Jesus. Think about that for a minute. Do you think Satan's going to bother with some backslider? Some kind of carnal person? Some lost sinner? No. He already has his minions taking care of that. He's already got the world and the flesh already taking care of that. But there's a Christian who's on fire for the Lord and says, Man, I got saved. I want to serve Jesus Christ. Satan is looking down. He said, Aha. Uh -huh. We'll see about that. We'll see about that. And as soon as you walk out of the doors of this church, and you return home, all of a sudden you get a phone call where something bad happen. has happened. Amen. You're going to get something that happened when you go back to work. And all of a sudden, the work life seems to fall apart on you. All of a sudden, there's some kind of catastrophe that happened in the church when you come back to the church. Sometimes you're going to come across situations in life where Satan just all of a sudden attacks. And the reason why he does that is because he wants to damper the fire before it blows up. Before it brights light, before it lights brighter and brighter, he wants to put the fire out. What's common sense when you see a fire stirring up? The common sense is take a bowl of water and put it out. Not to let it burn. Do you think Satan has no common sense and he's just going to let it burn? He's going to let the fire burn and burn and burn like a cinder until the fire becomes unstoppable for Jesus Christ? Have you ever seen a fire that just grows so big that it's unstoppable? Satan, he can predict and see things. He is not all-knowing, but he's got more sense than you got. He's been around for 6,000 years and seen human nature, how they serve God and how it goes brighter and brighter. He knows which pitfalls to use, which traps to use, which tactics to use to attack people in the church. My father told me this, and I'm convinced more than ever that he's right about this. My father, who's a minister, told me two things, Gene, that I see in the church that has ruined people the most. Carnality, that affects everybody. But there are two major things that he's seen where people don't come to church anymore. It's busyness and marriage. Those are the two main things. Busyness was on top. And then the second thing after that would be your relationship. And I've seen that to be so true. I hope that today's sermon will be a blessing to you and help you. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Yeah. Yeah. Deceiving your own self. You hear the preaching and you go, amen. You get on the altar. You say things. I'm going to do this for God. I'm going to do that for God. No, be doers. Be doers. Don't just say it. Walk the walk. Don't just talk the talk. Let's pray. Father God, I'm preaching a sermon that Satan does not want this sermon to go out. I'm preaching a sermon <coughs> where your people, your children, can continue to work in the field, in the harvest, and labor ferociously for your name. And Satan, he wants to attack the seeds that are sown. And he keeps producing stony ground. He keeps producing grounds with thorns. He keeps sending those birds to take away the seeds. I pray that you'll please keep those crows and ravens far away from this sermon. And that you'll take full control. May seeds be scattered everywhere. And may it bring forth fruit a hundredfold. To people here and to people online. You deserve the glory, Lord. May the fire not go out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to look at verse 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. 
That's the key. What's the key, Pastor? The key to make the sheep scatter is when you smite the shepherd. Now, Jesus Christ, he's the chief shepherd of your souls. Amen? Yes, amen. Now, do you know what the word pastor means? It also relates to shepherding the flock. Satan, he already smote the shepherd a long time ago at Calvary, and he lost. In fact, the people grew hundreds to thousands, and it kept marching on for 2,000 years. So God, so God had an all-powerful shepherd that Satan cannot overthrow. But how many shepherds on this earth who are humans and who are not Jesus Christ, who are pastors of churches, have Satan fallen one by one by one? And then you see the sheep scattered. You know who Satan's going to attack? He's going to attack the pastor of the church. He's going to attack the evangelist. He's going to attack the missionary. He's going to attack people who have some sort of responsibility for shepherding the sheep. Do you know why Satan goes after them? That way the people, when they're coming to this room right now and hear the message, they don't change their lives after this. They don't go out and serve Jesus Christ more after this. If I preach to you a mellow, watered-down sermon that did not convict or motivate your heart, you would be just like everybody else going to other different churches who just go back to a lunch buffet, sing along, get along with everybody, talk about the next football game, what's on the news, and what's going on in politics and office, and who's winning, and then, yeah, I want to go back to watch that wicked movie i want to go back and listen to the worldly music look at that worldly dressing that you're dressed up in yeah i like mine too you go back to the world you go back to sin you go back to the flesh that's what happens if you don't get a pastor that preaches conviction if you get a pastor that smiles at you 24 7 and makes you feel comfortable if you get a pastor that does not mention your specific sin if you don't get a pastor that talks about a specific right doctrine. If you don't have a pastor that tries to get this church riled up. So Satan, you know who's going, who he's going to attack? The men of God. If you don't think so, picture what it's like without an evangelist. Picture what it's like without a missionary. Picture what it's like without a pastor. How do you think the people are going to survive? Will there be any more ministry here in San Jose? Will there be any more ministry in other parts of the world, in foreign countries? What will happen if the shepherd is smitten? Then what will happen to the sheep? So you know what you need to do? What you need to do is that you need to support the shepherd. You need to pray for the shepherd. You need to... Help out the shepherd. You need to protect the shepherd. The reason why is because Satan, he's going to attack the shepherd more than any other person in the church. Why? Because he knows the church will not march on. He knows the church will close. He knows that tracts will stop passing out. He knows that the sermon will not be preached. He knows that efforts that are made to spread Bible-believing truth will come to a halt once he attacks the preacher. Satan, the people he hates the most, more than anybody else, are preachers. That's right, sir. He hates those people the most out of a Bible-believing community. Oh, he's not worried about scholars. They got too much facts in their heads, oh, yeah. and they're just dead in their spiritual walk for Jesus Christ. Oh, he's not worried about the Christian who hardly comes to church and who's rich with a lot of money. Oh, no, he's not worried about that. The world got them sucked up. He's not worried about. What he's worried about is preachers who have a heart for Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter how small they are. He's scared of those preachers who are so small, yet they keep pressing on for Jesus. Because he knows that he can't get them with numbers. He knows he can't trick the pastor and water them down with numbers, with fame, with more money, with more comfortable salary with uh, more people in the church. He knows he can't get them with a nice church bill. He knows he can't get those preachers anymore. He hates those preachers the most. Not the preachers who are well off, <clears throat> get good money, good pay, and have a humongous church building with a lot of numbers. Don't get me wrong. God has used some Bible-believing preachers like that, but how many of them are out there? How much is the greater majority of preachers who are well off in large churches falling into apostasy? 
Because Satan knows eventually the world will catch up with the preacher. He knows the flesh. He knows that fame. He knows that pleasure will eventually get the preacher. He knows that he'll get them one day. That's why I want to ask you this question. If the shepherd is smitten, will you still come to San Jose Bible Baptist Church? Will you still pass out tracts, preach the gospel on the streets? That's good. Come on. What are you going to do? I want you to picture right now if your pastor were not, was not to continue anymore. If your pastor just died all of a sudden. What are you going to do with your Christian walk? What happened to, I just got saved, I have a fire for Jesus Christ. What happened to that now? What happened to, I'm going to, let's go out street preaching tomorrow. Let's go have a prayer meeting tomorrow. What if pastor dies tomorrow? What happened to that? You know what I love? One thing about Dr. Ruckman when he passed away in his funeral. You know what they did? They just immediately went to PBI class after that. Because they said this. That's what Dr. Ruckman would have wanted. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You know why? They knew we better get back to work. You know, the, there are cultists and heretics and trolls who hated Bible-believing truth and have attacked the King James Bible and dispensational truth. And they thought that because Jack Chick died and Dr. Peter S. Ruckman died, that the Bible-believing community will all perish, will all fade away, will go into nothing. You're dead wrong. I still see that missionary there over there in the Fiji Islands. See a missionary there in Africa and Malawi and South Africa. I see missionaries in Korea and I still see missionaries in China and Indonesia and in Muslim nations. And I still see Bible-believing pastors holding the sword, the word of life on the street corners of their local communities. I still see Bible-believing pastors preaching out the King James Bible, not an ESV, not an NIV, not the NKJV. And you can make 20 more versions of the KJV, but you will never out-popularize this book. This book had billions of copies already. You will not take this thing down. You will not take away Bible-believing truth. God's truth will march on. You know why? There are people out there, not just you, people out there whose shepherds have been smitten, but they did not scatter. They did not scatter. By the way, who should be your shepherd anyway, your ultimate shepherd? It should be Jesus Christ. Is he not alive? Is he not resurrected? Right. Dr. Ruckman's in the grave. Jack Chick's in the grave. And Gene Kim will be in the grave. And Bible-believing preachers will be in the grave. But one person is out of his grave. One person is out of his tomb. You won't see Jesus' name in that tomb anymore. All you will see is he is not here, for he is risen. That shepherd is not out of business, so what are you doing? Get back to work. What are you doing? Pass out tracts. What are you doing? Get on your knees and pray. What are you doing? Pray for the lost souls. What are you doing? Love the brother and sister in Christ in the church. What are you doing? Rebuke the sin and the sinner. Expose wrong doctrine. What are you doing? Help the people who are hurting. What are you doing? Get back to work. Get back to work. Because the shepherd is still on the throne. His rod and his staff is still comforting you. Psalms 23 is not based on a Bible-believing pastor or any pastor. It's based on God Almighty, the great Amen. Jehovah, the great I am that I am. Amen. Because he's your shepherd, you should keep doing your job, sheep. What are you going to do when Pastor Kim dies, huh? I want you to make a dedication on this altar on what are you going to do when your pastor dies. You know, I've seen actually, which is... I don't want to scare people, but I want to tell you the urgency. That way you can, don't lose the fire. But I've seen preachers' wives and their children when their husbands passed away. And then what happened to the ministries? I know of one who's keeping the ministry going somewhere in Africa. God bless her heart. That's a lot of hard work. I took over a church where uh, she lost her husband and she left behind six children. I had to take care of that kind of a church. Because I didn't want that church. I didn't want the sheep to be scattered. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do, huh? When the shepherd is smitten. Then what happened to your zeal, huh? What happened to your love for Jesus, huh? What happened to, I will not deny thee, Jesus. I forsake the world. What happened to that? Notice in verse 33. Peter answered and said unto him, 
Though all men shall be offended. Though all men shall be offended. You know, another problem with zealous, sincere Christians is, is because they see so many people in the world being offended and falling apart. If you look at that word offend, you will see that matches with the parable of the sower and the seed. And you know what? There are The Bible says this. The Bible says there was a particular ground that could not grow. You know why? It was a stony, hard ground. You know why? I'll tell you why. What happened? Because when persecution ariseth, they were offended. You know what we get? Oh, yeah, let's serve Jesus Christ. I'll do that. But what happens? Then uh, certain things come up that prevents you from coming into church. It's a little bit more busyness with your work. It's your relationship with so-and-so that's bogging you down. It's somebody in the church that you feel uncomfortable and keeps you away. It's some kind of sickness in your health that deteriorates and you feel like, I can't come to church anymore. It's something that's some trouble is going on in your household with your friends out there. Some trouble is going on in your workplace. There's something that offends you, and that's what Satan is looking for. Satan is looking for that, church. Is he? Did you, didn't you remember the verse? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Yeah, that's right. He's watching. He knows what made you offended. You know why? You know why? He's seen mankind for the past 6,000 years. Right, yeah. You're no different. He's seen them all. Yeah. And he took care of them all. He made every one of them sin. He made every one of them sin. You see, Abraham, the start of the new nation, he fell. Noah, who would have repopulated the whole world, started a new kingdom, he fell. Oh, Satan's been watching everybody. He says, I got a world record of people in my list. I got every single person, not one, not once did I lose a battle, not even once. I caused all of these people, at least one of these people, to sin, to slip up something. I even got the Apostle Paul. He lost a couple years of his ministry just because of his zeal and sincerity for souls out there. I got Simon Peter to deny Jesus Christ just because of his zeal and sincerity for the Lord. Oh, I got Moses, too, to commit murder. I got him to commit murder, an unspeakable sin, just because of his sincerity and zeal for protecting his people. I got them all, Satan said. There was one person he could not knock out, and that is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That gave him heyday ever since. He hated that ever since. That changed the course of all history. That now it literally changed all of history from B.C. to A.D. just because of that cross at Calvary. It shook up Satan's world. But now you got Christ in you. And that's why he hates you. You know why? Jesus Christ is in you. He sees God Almighty in you. And he hates that more than anything else. And he's going to ruin and batter that temple of the Holy Ghost. He's going to do whatever he can to torture your body, to ruin your body, to make you sin in your body, to make your body backslide and not get back on the work on the field for Jesus Christ. Because all he sees Jesus Christ and he hates you. That's why he hates you. You know why? Because you got God Almighty in you. And the closest thing that can give him pleasure and joy right now is to batter and bruise you. That's the closest thing that he can hurt the heart of God. You know why? Because there was only one, there was only one particular group of people, beings, out of all of creation that ever moved the heart of God. That was mankind. Only mankind moved the heart of God to leave his throne from heaven and become human flesh, be tortured, stripped naked, spitting upon and beaten, and die for you on the cross. Only one group of people moved the heart of God to do that. So Satan knows the only way he can attack God is to attack you, his heart, who are now made bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, the wife of Jesus Christ, the church. That's the closest thing that can give him joy and pleasure. 
Oh, you think you're going to come to church this Sunday? You think that you're going to uh, come to street preaching? You have a fire for Jesus Christ. You want to serve Jesus Christ. Hey, let's get back to prayer meeting. Let's get back to soul winning. Hey, pastor, I want to help you out. Teach me how to preach and teach. I volunteer to help out the kitchen. I volunteer to clean up. I want to come in early and help set everything up. I don't want the pastor to do everything. Oh, we'll see about that, says Satan. We'll see about that. And then he lets offense rise. Do you know how many times, the number one thing that I've seen, the number one thing that I've seen that causes people to deteriorate away is verse 33, because of offense. Because of offense. Satan brings up things in your life that offends you. And that's what makes you not come back to church anymore. That's what makes you lose the fire. Do you know how many people who come to church, you're not the only one. Ask the other people who've been to this church for several years. Do you know how many zealous Christians that I met when, I, when we talk about, man, this certain Bible-believing Christian who's on fire, but now what happened? We don't see them in church anymore. Now what happened? We don't see them back in the fold and just sharing the fire with us. And then you as a beginner would go, I don't understand that. Do you know how many of my members who've been here for several years know exactly what you're feeling right now? They've all been through that. And they've also experienced the offense that risen up. And then they realized, they opened their eyes and they realized, I did not realize how hard it was to serve Jesus Christ after that. You would think that you're on fire. You got the zeal. You got the passion. There's no way you'd fall back into the world. There's no way you would skip church. You'd be surprised when a fence rises up. If you don't think so, then talk to the people who've been to my church in our early stages, who've been here for at least three years. Talk to them. You'll learn real fast. People come, people go. That's one thing I learned. People come, people go. I don't want to think like that. People in my church, some of them who know me more closely, they know how much of a skeptic I am. They know how negative-minded I could be, like preparing for the worst in everything. But I'll be honest with you, in this liberal area, Silicon Valley, San Francisco Bay Area, that's the only reason why my ministry survived right here. It's only because of that. You know why? Unfortunately, we have to think about the worst in people, not the best. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? You know why? I don't trust flesh. Amen. I don't trust the world. Amen. I especially don't trust the devil, that he's going to give it to me a little easy. It's not because that I detest people, I think negatively of you. No, because I understand human nature because I'm human like you. The reason why I would think so negatively about human nature is because I'm human like you. I know what I'm capable of. I know my weaknesses and vulnerabilities, and I know once I give in, there's no turning back. What keeps me, you know what keeps this preacher going? You'd be surprised, it's fear. Because I know that once I skip, there's no turning back. That's why the fear of the Lord truly is the beginning of what? Wisdom. You're being smart. You're being smart. I'm sorry if I have to think the worst out of situations, people, and all kinds of circumstances, but that's fear. And that's what makes you make wise decisions if something bad happens. Yeah, Isn't that sad? Isn't that bad? That should make you angry, right? Against this flesh, the world, and the devil. It's a fence. It should make you angry. It should make you, you know what you literally have to do? You literally have to kick yourself to come to Sunday like that. You literally have to kick yourself to get your nose in the book. You have to kick yourself so that you can get on your knees and pray. You have to kick you and you alone. You have to kick yourself to get back on the field for God. Amen. That's good. This verse says, though, uh, in verse 33, though all men shall be offended because of what? Thee. You ever thought about that? You know what gets people out of serving God? You know what they get offended because of? They don't think about this. You don't think about this, but it's because of God. Didn't you know that? The offense comes from God. Why did God allow that situation to happen? He could have told the devil, no. 
Why did God allow it? So this is important for you. And I don't understand why we Christians don't understand this. I had this ingrained in me like a drill. And the first person I would think of in my church is Big Chuck. How he said this and what he said helped me so many times. He always said that whenever something bad happens, God's doing this to test me. God's doing this to test to see if I will hold out. And then I'm going to get the blessing. I will get the answer to yes, the prayer. Sir. I will get the success. I will get the joy. But I need to pass this test Amen. first. Amen. How many people still do not understand that? Amen. When something bad happens, when something hard happens, we don't think this is a test. We want the blessing now. We want the success now. We want the answer to the prayer request now. We want the comfort now. We want God to help us out right now. No, child, this is a test for you so that God can see if you can really prove yourself that you'll be faithful. Then you get the success. Then you get the blessing. Then you get the comfort. Not now. Can we as humans not understand that lesson? After 6,000 years, you would think mankind would finally understand that lesson. Mankind can never understand that. That's why we have to have technology or we'll go crazy. Because mankind needs it now. Now. Now and now. What a, what a messed up, blasted, wicked, lazy, slothful, degenerate world that we live in today. I'm so sorry that you have to see an ugly side of me today. But the reason why I'm so angry is because I'm angry at sinful human nature. I'm so upset how many times I let my Lord down. I'm upset how many times where I had the heart and sincerity and I just broke God's heart again. I'm so upset at myself where I thought that I got my bases covered and I thought I armed myself completely that the devil found a hole and hit me still. I'm so mad at myself. I'm so mad at human flesh. Your worst enemy should not be the devil. Your worst enemy should be you, your flesh. It should be the, this detestable thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout and run the aisles when Satan is cast into the lake of fire. But I'm going to sing and shout louder when I, got, when I get raptured out of this demonic, hellish body. You know what the number one thing, I don't know about you, friend. You know what the number one thing that I want the most in my whole entire life? Is that I will never sin again. I will never displease my Lord again. I don't know about you at the judgment seat of Christ. The number one thing that I want at the judgment seat of Christ is not the gold, not the silver, not the precious stones, not cities to rule, not an inheritance of literally all things. What I want the most is that God will say, good job, son. You made me proud. Amen. That's what I want the most. You know why? Because I hate letting my God down, the one who died for me, the only one who ever loved me enough to take up all my sin. There was no other human, not even my mother, not even my father, ever loved me that much. Only Jesus Christ did it all for me. He's the only one who loved me enough to never sin for 33 and a half years and went through all sorts of temptations like as we are, yet without sin. That's right. You try your husband, your wife, your son and your daughter, your mother and your father, your best friend, your loved one, no one can pull up that much love for you. That's right. Amen. Whoever lived 33 and a half years without sin and dying for you. Because of thee. You got to understand this. This trial is from God. You got to think like that. We know that, don't get me wrong, we know that Satan attacks the church. And we'll say Satan's attacking. Don't get me wrong. It's because of things that naturally happen. And you'll just have to naturally deal with it. Don't get me wrong. Maybe it's because you're weak and you're vulnerable. You should be stronger. Don't get me wrong about that. But ultimately, you got to understand and think this all the time. God is testing me right now. God is testing me right now. If I want that prize, if I want that reward, if I want that success and blessing at the end, I better hold on a little longer. It's not forever. It's not forever. Why are you so impatient? Why are you too comfortable? Why are you so Laodicean and weak? 
can't you just hold on a little longer to Jesus and that answer to prayer will come. That blessing will fall down and shower upon you. That success that God promised will come to you. Can't you just hold on a little longer? Hold on a little longer. God is testing you right now. So if I'm going through something right now, I got to think this way. It's because, Lord, you're testing me. And I thought that way before I became a pastor. Right before I became a pastor, after I graduated Bible school, Satan poured everything on me. I went through so much sleepless nights and pain and hardship. And I stayed faithful to every church service and soul winning event and kept myself going full time through college and through church and through work. I remember that. But you know what made me grip my teeth and not quit? Because there was one thing going in my mind. God says, if you can't pass this child, what makes you think that you can pass the next one that I've called for you? I had no idea I would have 97,000 subscribers online. I had no idea that I would meet Brother Eric and Brother Tom in our church. I never thought that I would see Brother Sean winning almost 100 souls to salvation. I never thought that I would see a Brother Robert who would upload and take care of emails for me. I never thought that I'd see Brother Jack who would play the piano at times and sing with me specials. I never thought that Brother Brent would play the piano for our church. I never thought that I would see brothers and sisters in Christ who tell me to take care of their funeral, to take care of their wedding, to witness to their loved one, their family member to salvation. I never thought that I'd ever meet Filipino people, Russian people, Tongan people, Caucasians and Hispanics, Chinese, Korean. I never thought that I would meet this kind of diversity. But that was something the Lord did not show me at the age of 19. That was something the Lord told me. You, I can't put you to the next level. I can't use you until you pass this test. And that's what you got to understand. You don't know the blessing. You don't know the reward. You don't know the happiness and the joy that God can give to you that he promised. I'm at the best stage of my life ever from the past 30 years of my life. This is my bliss. This is my heaven for now. I never thought I'd attain something like this. I am truly content with what I have today. God's been more than good to me. And some of you know about the situations I had to go through and even the recent situations I had to go through. But you see what happens when you pull through and what God will bless you with? Amen. You don't know the blessing. God doesn't show you the blessing. You don't know. But can't you have faith that he is truly good? Yeah. That he is not a liar and he will bless you with success? Can you not hold him to his word like a good father? That he's a good father to you. And just hold on a little longer, child. Please hold on a little longer. Why can't you hold on a little longer? Notice the last part of verse 33. Yet will I never be offended. You see the problem with zealous spiritual Christians are? This is important. Oh, we all act humble. We all act humble. Oh, you know, uh, oh, I'm not that great of a preacher. I'm not that great of a teacher. Oh, yeah, thank the Lord for using me. Oh, it's only by his grace. Oh, be quiet. All right, don't, don't, get rid of that facade. Be quiet. Pastor Kim, you say that all the time. That's right, because I'm trying to act humble too. But get off that facade, Gene Kim. Because deep down inside your heart of hearts, there's some kind of a conscious thing in your mind that has pride. Yeah, that's right. Pride does not come out consciously. It comes out unconsciously. Well, I don't think that I'm pride. Well, you know, I did check all the bases on my pride. I think I made sure that I'm humble. You got to understand this. This is something that I also learned in psychology, which is very interesting. A large portion of your mind, like 80% of your brain, is unconscious, not conscious. A small portion of your brain is only, percentage is only conscious. How is the devil going to get the pride out of you? Because he's seen mankind 6,000 years, how he attacked their unconscious states and how the pride developed. Well, you know, I'm not that great of a preacher. I'm not that great of a teacher. You know, praise the Lord if I taught and preached something good. And the pastor says, okay, so I'm going to have brother so-and-so preach and teach for us. And all of a sudden you're like, what? I preach better than him. 
Get in pastoral conferences. All right? Now, if you're a missionary and you got pastor's friend, you know what I'm talking about. Get in conferences where, you know, you think that you're a better teacher and preacher when you hear the preacher, and all of a sudden, they don't call on you. And then you feel hurt inside. And you're like, I don't get to preach. I don't get to teach. I don't get to present my word. You see? On pride. Ouch! Good. Good. We need to park it right here. We need to park it right here. We need to skip lunch and we'll just park it right here. You know what the problem is? We, we're all, you don't realize how capable you are of being wicked as hell, as being prideful as the devil. Satan says, I will be like the Most High. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, above the heights of the cloud. I, I, and Simon Peter right here, without knowing that it is out of pride, he says, I will never be offended. Watch out. Watch out. Unconsciously, where you're like, I want to serve Jesus Christ, pride is lurking inside. Be careful. Man, I hate the world and the flesh and the devil. Be careful, that's pride. And that's why spiritual zealous Christians can be the number one burden in the church. Did you pay attention? Did you pay attention? It's not the carnal and the worldly people. The, oh, they already got their problems. The one that pastor has to deal with all the time are spiritual zealots. And sometimes they'll get too much of a hothead and they lack wisdom and they make unwise decisions. They jump the gun and they're like, let's serve Jesus Christ. And in the end, they cause hurt for the pastor. They cause hurt to people in the church too, not just the pastor. That's why we get in a critical judgmental attitude and that should be repented and gotten right with God don't you think that don't you think that the Lord will fix them don't you think that they already know through the preaching of the Word of God don't you think that already they've been taken care of and that the problem is with you not with them it's too easy to look at so-and-so sitting next to you on the world record of church attendance with you and theirs, it's so easy to do that. But see, that's what Satan wants. He wants you to get your eyes off of your deficiencies and look at other people's that's deficiencies, right. oh, and that is pride. Amen. That is pride. That is just as wicked as hell. And you gotta watch out when you say, you gotta realize this. If you had the humility that I can mess up easily tomorrow I can be a wicked sinner I can be worse than so-and-so in the church I might do something say something that would hurt somebody in the church or hurt the past if you have that mentality don't you think that that's a fit that it's gonna produce in your mind I gotta be more watchful now with what I'm going to say with what I do and I can predict that this temptation this trial is what Satan's going to use on me, so I'm going to watch out for that. And don't you think that brother and sister in Christ will last in church a little longer? Did this open your eyes about, you know what humility does? Humility makes you avoid the, most, the, the sins and the errors that you tend to make. Prideful people, they think they got it all settled, taken care of. That's why the hardest people to win to Jesus Christ are prideful people. Because they think they got it all. They got it all taken care of. You got to think like this. I can hurt pastor after this church is over. That brother and sister in Christ behind me, I might say or do something that might hurt them just during fellowship, even after the service. I am capable of hurting my son, daughter, husband, and wife tomorrow, the next day. I am capable of bruising my Savior once more when I close the day today. If you would think like that, then don't you think that you would be more watchful, that you'd be more dedicated, and you'd be uh, more motivated, and you would have the fear of the Lord to avoid something dumb and stupid and sinful and wrong? Let God take control. Put yourself down and elevate Jesus Christ. You need to put yourself down and elevate Jesus Christ above all and everything else. And why is it that you always get depressed easily, discouraged easily, tired easily? Don't come to church easily when some offense happened. 
That just motivates the devil more to keep playing that card on you. That's his ace in the hole now. Now he's going to keep putting that card on play to get on you. Now look at this one. Peter said, I will never be offended. But verse 34, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. We're waiting for our night watches, amen? We're waiting for our night watches when Jesus Christ will soon rapture us up to heaven. Amen. We're waiting for that dawn, the day star to arise in our hearts. But you know what Satan's job is? To make you deny God before the rapture sounds. Right. His job is that before the cock crows and before the day star dawns, that he's going to get you to deny Jesus Christ. And not just once, not just twice, but several times. He wants you to deny Jesus Christ as many times as you can. He's going to squeeze that out of you because he wants to hurt God so much as he can before he fries in hell for all eternity. What are you going to do, church? The rapture is getting closer and closer. And when the rapture is getting closer and closer, that means you need to realize that I can't deny Jesus Christ so soon, too early. Not now. Why would I deny him now? Isn't it amazing how Peter, as soon as he heard the message from Jesus, he was so quick to deny Jesus Christ three times before even the next day broke out? But that's Satan. He gets on human flesh, hits your weak point, and he'll edge your weak point with a little prick and he'll go like this to you. And he'll get you to deny Jesus Christ multiple times as soon as this message is over. Yep. And you, you're going to go on the altar and you're going to dedicate your life. I don't want to deny you, Jesus Christ. But then Satan, he's going to get you to deny him like Simon Peter. I won't deny you, Jesus. He's going to get you to deny you. Why are you being so pessimistic, Pastor? Because I want you to be fully armed, fully humbled, fully determined. Let's not slip. Let's not deny Jesus Christ. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 26. Do you realize that we're in the same chapter, folks? We're in the same chapter where, G where Peter said, I won't deny you, Jesus. We're in the same chapter. Look at verse 69. Now, I want you to literally picture this with your Christian walk, please. Literally picture this with your own Christian walk. Now, Peter sat without in the palace. And a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. Ah, so here's the first step to where Peter denied Jesus within the same chapter. You ready for this? He wasn't with Jesus inside. He was outside in the palace with the world. Oh, wow. That's the first step to denial, is that you don't get your nose in this bulk, and you don't pray on your knees today, and I mean today, if you don't do that, if you don't get in Jesus Christ, you're just like the rest of the world. Let's wake up and go to work. Let's study. Let's follow the schedule. Let's please my children, my husband, my wife. Let's keep all my things in order. Brush your teeth. Take a shower. You know, watch TV for a couple hours and then go online and do the chats. Let's go out uh, with my other friends out there. And then, see, that's the first step to denying Jesus Christ is to be like the outside world. Now, Come on, picture your life. Didn't you see that? That's why you deny Jesus every week after Sunday. Doesn't that make sense? That's the first step. I could preach this as a second sermon from 69 through 75. Let's keep reading here. And a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. You see what happens right here? What happens right here in verse 69 through 70, Peter, he didn't cuss up a storm. He didn't do anything strong or wicked. He just says, no, I don't know Jesus. You know what happens after that? It's that denial stage in your mind where, uh, not today, I'll read my Bible. 
I'm, I'm not messing up. I'm not becoming a wicked sinner just by skipping today. Since it's not a big thing, you know, I'm, I'm just tired. That, that's the number one line, tired. Tired, 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 tired. Well, aren't you, aren't we all tired? Isn't your flesh tired? Maybe this flesh is so wicked that it just wants to feel tired all the time. Verse 70. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. Verse 71. And he, when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. Now, you know what happens? It gets worse. In verse 71, it's not that he's in the world now. Now, everybody else, not just one damsel, but everybody else is starting to know, hey, this guy's a Christian. Now, everyone knows what you've been doing Sunday morning. You weren't at church. They know that you were at home. They know that you were at work. They know you were with them doing something. The world recognizes real fast who you are because they see you at work. They see you living next door to them. They see your everyday living and conversation. They know who you are. Now your testimony is getting a little influence. Now people in the church are going to start talking about you. What happened to so-and-so? What's going on with so-and-so? See, testimony now is getting ruined and spreading. And then now you're... Now you're going with an oath right here. Verse 72, he denied with an oath. Now the denial is so strong that it transformed now into an oath where it's locked and strong, where first time it was just a denial, a simple denial. Oh, I can't read the Bible today, but that became an oath now in your unconscious mind because the past seven months, you kept saying the same line. I'm not reading the Bible tonight. Now look at verse 73. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. Now you know what happens in verse 33? There are glimpses and fruits, pieces of fruits from your, from your spiritual walk. Because you had the spiritual zeal for Jesus. It's not like the fruit disappears like that. There are traces of it remaining. And people, even though you're drinking at a bar, they, knew, they know there's something different about you. For thy speech bereath thee. I notice that when we play that music, you're not really into it. What's up? I know that when I gave you that drink, you weren't that excited. I remember then when we're trying to look at these dirty images that you would kind of hesitate and then you would turn your face away. What happened when we're talking at lunchtime during break after work, you know? I noticed that you're not really into it. I, I saw you pray before uh, over your meal. Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't pray. I didn't pray. I don't know what you're talking about. See, you know what happens now? What happens now, your testimony is truly ruined because they see gl glimpses of fruits and traces of your Christian walk, and now you're totally denying that. You're saying, no, I don't go to San Jose Bible Baptist Church anymore. I used to go to that church, but not anymore. I used to soul win, and I don't do that anymore. I used to believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. I don't do that anymore. And then you know what you do? You start to curse, and you start to swear, and you say, I don't do that anymore. How quick you've fallen. How quick have you fallen? You notice from verses 69 through 73, you know how Peter becomes like that? Because he rationalizes it in his head. He always comes up with an excuse, with the reason why he can't go to church, why he can't read the Bible, why he can't come to prayer meetings, street preaching and visitation, why he has to remain dressed up the old way, the wrong appearances and clothes, why he has to listen to the same old music even though he knows it's wrong, why he has to watch the same old wrong stuff in the movies and the videos and in online and the chats and your computers and your cell phones and every other digital device that I did not know yet that I've covered base on. He knows that you're always going to rationalize and make an excuse why you're doing it. And you're going to come up with a spiritual reason and a spiritual excuse to justify your spiritual neglect. Then what happens? Verse 74, and immediately the cock crew. 
And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. You know what happens at verse 75? I'll tell you what happens to spiritual zealous Christians. Once they pass step one of denial, step two with an oath, and step three where they really shoot their Christian testimony, you know what happens to them? They get discouraged. They weep bitterly. And they can't come back to San Jose Bible Baptist Church anymore because they're afraid of what so-and-so might say to them. They're afraid of so-and-so what they might think about them. They come in shame. And they'll know that they feel welcome and loved and shake your hand and stuff like that. But they're going to be thinking inside, brother, sister, so-and-so, pastor, so-and-so thinks of me that way. And because of that, they will never come back to church again. You know how Satan really gets on spiritual zealous Christians? It's through discouragement. He really eats on them with discouragement. And you got to kick discouragement in the rear end and don't let discouragement get to you. Who cares what brother, sister, so-and-so says and thinks or what pastor so-and-so says and thinks? You better get your rear end into church and sit down and listen to the word of God. Amen. Kick discouragement in the rear end. Who cares what discouragement says? Satan always likes to discourage you. Oh, you're a wicked sinner. Oh, you messed up again. Oh, what do you think pastor so-and-so is going to think of you? Oh, you repented. You got right with the, with the Lord the thousand time again. Oh, you know you're going to mess up tomorrow and... How uncomfortable will you feel during the fellowship when you're around the brother and sister? What can you say to them? How are you going to fellowship with them? Won't you feel so uncomfortable? And you see how Satan always gets on your flesh? That's fleshy. Discouragement is fleshy. Do you realize this is a sin? Discouragement is a fleshy sin that you use to satisfy yourself. It's not to make you feel bad. It's to make you feel good. Because you think that by feeling bad, you have reasons not to come back to church again. Reasons not to get back to work again for Jesus Christ. No, deep down inside, you don't want to fight it. You don't want to fight the tears, the discouragement, the uncomfortable tensions, and the people. You don't want to fight it. You don't want to face the music. Deep down inside, you're afraid of your flesh, how you would feel more than pleasing God. We need to stop weeping bitterly. And realize that Jesus Christ is the person that wipes away all tears from our eyes. And he's the one that's still on the throne and still in control. And he's the one that says a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. He's the one who says if your brother trespass against you seven times in the day. Thou and say I repent thou shalt forgive him. We got to realize that Jesus Christ said if I am faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Amen. We got to hold Jesus to his promise as far as the east is from the west. So far out, he removed our transgressions from Amen. us. Wipe the tears from your eyes. Get on the altar. Get right with God. Because if you don't, then you know what's going to happen at verse 74? The cock will crow and you will deny Jesus Christ thrice. When that rapture sounds and that cock crows and you deny Jesus Christ thrice, how hard will you weep harder at the judgment seat of Christ than right now? I would rather weep now, get right with God, than weep at the judgment when that Amen. cock crows. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. If the Lord spoke upon your heart, please feel free to come down here for it on the altar's floor. You can pray on the altar or you can pray in your seat. It doesn't matter. But enough with denying Jesus. We're such spiritual zealots. I'm King James only. I'm dispensational. I'm Bible believer. And Satan uses that to trip you up to make you fall. I'm a pastor. I'm an evangelist. I'm a missionary. I led souls to salvation. I planted ministries. I passed out thousands of tracts. I led hundreds of souls to salvation. I preach hundreds of sermons. Repent and get right with God. Don't, don't be a Simon Peter who's spiritually zealous and then he'll deny Jesus. Be humble. Be humble. Be fearful. Be determined. Be strong, not discouraged. And get back on the saddle and ride your horse and serve God Almighty. Let's weep bitterly now. Let's repent now. Let's confess our sins now. Not at the judgment. God forbid, not the judgment. Not the judgment. That cock's about to crow. Sun is rising. 
dawn is about to rise. You see it over the horizon. We see it everywhere in our world. Jesus is coming. Something's going on in Mecca. Something's going on in China. Something's going on in Russia. The government in America is changing a whole lot. Things are setting up in the Vatican. Things are setting up at Jerusalem. Technology is scaring us. Sun is about to shine. The day star is about to rise. The cock is about to crow. This is not a time to deny Jesus Christ. If you want to weep bitterly, do it now. Don't do it at the judgment. Don't do it at the judgment. Let all hearts repent and throw it on the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him fix our problem. Let him fix our infirmities. Let us hold our swords and not deny Jesus Christ. Don't be prideful now. Be humble. Love the brother and sister in Christ in church. You know better than them. You're just as capable, if not even worse than them, if Satan pulled the same trick on you. Stop being discouraged and crying about it. Wipe those tears. Encourage yourself in the Lord like David. Realize that Jesus Christ can still use you. Get back. Get back. Stop being hot-headed, impatient, and, yeah, I want to do this for Jesus Christ. Now be humble. Be watchful. Be submissive. Listen to instruction. Be faithful and loyal. And you will be one of the deadliest weapons that Satan will hate. And you can give one stab to the devil <laughs> before we get up. You can give at least one stab to the devil before we go up. God, my Father, I love you. But those are just words, Lord. My flesh is so weak. Perhaps I don't love you as much as I should. But God, I pray that this church, San Jose Bible Baptist Church, it will not have on its name Peter. After all, your church was not built upon a rock named Peter. Your church was built upon the rock, Jesus Christ. I pray that we will not be a Peter. Peter will not be our authority. Peter will not be our model. It will be Jesus Christ. Humble, obedient, quiet, submissive, faithful and loyal till the end of Calvary. Heavenly Father, may we become more like Jesus Christ and may we, may we burn up Silicon Valley and San Francisco Bay Area and the whole world like a blaze before you sound the rapture. We don't believe in a worldwide revival, but we believe we can bring a revival in our local community and parts around the world. We know that we can bring revivals throughout there to give you the better glory that you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. 
So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure. You could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.